English session of the last day of the Kolkata Literary Meet at the Western Quadrangle. Our first session is Dante's Divine Comedy, A 700-Year Journey. Shukanto Chaudhary and Doita Mojumda discuss the impact of one of the world's greatest literary works on its 700th anniversary in conversation with Shamon Tokdash. We have an introduction by Gianluca Rubagoti, the Consul General of Italy in Kolkata. A few words about our speakers. We have Shukanto Chaudhary, is Professor Emeritus at the Department of English, Shadavpur University. He has many publications on the European Renaissance and textual studies and was project director for Bichitro, the complete Tagore Varium website. Up next, we have Doita Mojumdar, who completed her first two degrees from Jadavpur University and her PhD from the University of St. Andrews. She is now the assistant professor of English at Jadavpur University. Uh, next, we have Shamon Tok Dash, who has successfully prolonged his misspent youth by remaining in university as student and Alish teacher for approximately 63% of his life, during which he has written and lectured on 19th century literature, translation, the relationships between biological sciences and literature, environment, ecology, rural development, and primary education. Can we please welcome our speakers on stage with a round of applause? Hello. Yeah. Um, thank you all for coming today to something that very closely resembles the inferno in terms of temperature. And, uh, you know, it's somewhat interesting and strange that a man who died 701 years ago is still, in a sense, alive in many ways. And without further ado, I'll request. Uh, the Consul General of Italy in Kolkata. I'm going to mispronounce his name now. Gianluca uh, <laughs> Rubagotti. Uh, oh, thank you. Uh, to say a few words about what Dante means to us today, in a sense. And then we will go on to the, the experts, Shukantada and Doita. Gianluca. Thank you. Thank you all. It's um, a great honor for me to be surrounded by such uh, eminent scholars. Of course, I'm not eminent, forget about being a scholar, but uh, I think uh, I have a small advantage compared to the other people on this stage. The advantage being that I am Italian and therefore I have been exposed earlier and in a more comprehensive way to the figure and the work of Dante Alighieri. Dante Alighieri's Divine Comedy, together with uh, Alessandro Manzoni's Promessi Sposi, The Betrothed, are the two pieces of Italian literature that are compulsory in schools, in high schools. I did my classical studies, so I had this professor who was uh, very learned about medieval literature, so he had uh, a very particular attraction also for Dante. So he considered that one scholastic year had like 35, 36 weeks. So from the second week, we were compelled to study one canto of Dante's until the end of the year. So basically I spent, uh, since my Dante's day was on Monday, I spent three years of Sunday's evening and late afternoons going through Dante Alighieri's Inferno, Purgatorio, and Paradiso, which I can recollect was not the easiest way to spend my Sunday afternoon or evenings. But uh, what is uh, Dante's today? Dante has had an immense influence on Italian literature. From the beginning, you know, the three crowns of Italian uh, language are Dante, Petrarca, and Boccaccio. Boccaccio was the first one to spread uh, the work uh, and uh, publicly appreciate the figure of Dante. With Petrarca, the relation is a little bit uh, 
different, but uh, of course Petrarca realizes the greatness of Dante as well. And uh, we celebrated last year 700 years. So as a Consul General of Italy here in Kolkata, we have tried to give it a more modern and if you want also a Bengali twist. So we had three initiatives. The first one being the creation of a dance performance inspired by the story of Paolo and Francesca. I don't know if uh, some of the speakers will talk about this love story later on. So we put on stage uh, a part of the Divine Comedy combined with the music of Tagore's uh, and uh, movements of classical dance of this part of the world. Then uh, we have uh, a project going on with a couple of universities in which uh, we have asked the students to draw and to paint and to create sculptures inspired by the Divine Comedy. And lastly, we created an adventure for a Bengali girl called Puchki. Puchki, together with her dog Kuki, are the protagonists of some comics written by Upol Shengupto, the famous uh, singer and also cartoonist. And uh, to celebrate Dante, we created the story of this girl from Bengal going to Florence and started talking to the statue of Dante Alighieri, and Dante takes her through Inferno, Purgatorio, and Paradiso and teaches her about uh, his work. So these are just, of course, some ideas that we had. Uh, but of course, I could talk uh, later on about the influence that Dante had on not just literature, but also different forms of art, and not only in Italy, but also in other countries of Europe. Right. Uh, thank you. I, I don't know how many in the audience have uh, read any Dante, uh, whether in Italian or in various translations. Uh, but we've got here uh, one of the most eminent scholars, not only of Dante, but of the Renaissance, Professor Shukanto Choudhury. Shukanto da to all of us. And I think maybe in a session like this, when one is talking about an author who is familiar and yet unfamiliar to most here. It might be a good idea to get an idea of what the hell was Dante all about, you know, in a sense. So I'll, I'll ask Shukanta that to start off with that. Can you hear me? Can you hear me? Okay. Well, uh, thank you, Shomot. So shall I start? The, and then you, uh, you can come in after a while and amplify what I was saying. Um, well, Dante, I mean, this is not a class. I don't intend it to, to turn it into one. Uh, so I will tell you nothing about the facts of Dante's life beyond the dates of birth and death, 1265 to 1321, as Shamantuk said. He died 701 years ago. So why should we read the works of a man who died 700 years ago? I mean, because so many people like us earn or earned our salary by teaching their works, but that's hardly a, you know, there are other ways we could have earned our living by digging ditches, for instance. So what's the point of reading Dante? You see, uh, I think there are two particular aspects of Dante which I think are still very, very relevant, and I should like to think particularly relevant to the Bengali psyche. One was that all his life, Dante was deeply steeped in politics. Chuti Rajniti Kurachi, and if you read the divine comedy, which is supposed to be a journey through the next world, outlining the entire theological structure of the Catholic Church and its view of the, the next world, the three realms of the next world, sometimes you're hard put to tell whether it's a religious or theological work or whether it's a political work. Because Dante was, I mean, he was born into one of the sort of uh, well-to-do uh, families of uh, Florence, Firenze. His father died so when he was quite young, his mother when he was even younger. But he got the usual education of his class. He became involved in the administration of Florence and therefore also in the politics, the very complicated politics of the time all through Italy, 
uh, there were these two major parties, the Ghibellini and the Guelfi, one lot largely favoring that curious person who stuck out in uh, Germany and commanded a kind of influence over much of Europe called the Holy Roman Emperor, and the other uh, followers of the Pope. This is a gross simplification of the history, but it's something like that. And then in Firenze, in Florence at that time, the followers of the emperors, the Ghibellini, they had been uh, sort of practically powerless, but as so often happens in these situations, the victorious political party is split into two. And Dante, unfortunately, threw in his lot with the faction that lost in the battle. He was exiled. And he spent the last several dec decades of his life in exile. Practically the whole of the Divine Comedy must have been written in exile. But he spent his exile thinking about Italy, moving from one state in Italy to another, thinking about the condition of Italy, which was, of course, at that time, completely divided between the fall of the Roman Empire and the reunification of Italy, the Risorgimento, in the 19th century. Italy was a, just a collection of fragmented city-states. And Dante's Divine Comedy is full of references to, well, the world of his time generally, which means the European world largely, but especially Italy and especially the politics of Firenze. Okay. Now, that is one side of it. The other really crucial, the, the most crucial aspect of Dante's work, all Dante's work, he didn't only write the Divine Comedy, he wrote a large number of works, beginning with a kind of collection of sonnets linked together with prose called La Vita Nuova, uh, The New Life, and then through a number of works on uh, various subjects to finally the grand climax of the Divine Comedy. But all these, figure, uh, these works are linked by the figure of a woman. And this figure, the, the woman called Beatrice Portinari, though in fact the figure might have very little to do with the actual woman of that name, who lived and then died very young in Florence. Uh, when Dante, she was just one year younger than Dante. And Dorita, would you like to sort of uh, say something about Beatrice to start us off? And then we'll find the returning to Beatrice through the entire discussion, I think. Hello. I'm on the yeah. Um, yeah, so uh, Dante's life, as Shukandada said, is, is, you know, um, sort of, or, and his entire oeuvre is um, plotted along these two axes of politics and love. And um, as um, later on in a 19th century essay, Tagore says, in a very precocious essay that Tagore wrote as a 17-year-old, he says that there is no imagining of the, either of Dante's life or any of his works without Beatrice. So Beatrice is this sort of single um, axis kind of that binds it uh, together. The, oh, uh, uh, so, uh, the f so Beatrice's presence marks every kind of work that Dante produces. The first one that engages extensively with uh, Beatrice is uh, this uh, text called La Vita Nuova, which was written before Dante went into exile, unlike most of his other major works, which were written after his exile in 1301. Uh, La Vita Nuova is, a, is, is written in the prosimetrum form. It is a collection of uh, poems, canzones, and sonnets, and then interspersed with prose explanations. And it tells us about the beginning of the poet's life as a poet. So it is uh, also the story of Dante's coming of age as a poet. And it is marked by the central point of La Vita Nuova is Beatrice's death. And it is Beatrice's death which is, you know, also in terms of the structure of the work, Beatrice's death, uh, vis Dante's vision of Beatrice's death is at the center of the work, uh, as indeed is the event of Beatrice's death in Dante's, uh, you know, self-construction and self-development as a poet. And uh, Dante talks about this inception of a new life, you know, around this point of uh, Beatrice's death. And at the end of the text, he tells us, uh, that uh, the way he has talked about this exceptional lady in his uh, works has not quite done her justice, and therefore he looks forward to talking about her in a way uh, that no other poet slash lover has ever talked about uh, his beloved. And then that is the sort of anticipation of Commedia, or uh, the Divine Comedy, which he starts writing admittedly almost a decade later, more than a decade later, uh, but it's sort of uh, in the works. Uh, Divine Comedy, as a text, he starts writing around 1308. It's written between 1308 and 1320, which is, he finishes it in 1320, a year before his death. 
Um, and the entire work, again, is structured along the lines of Beatrice's influence on Dante, even though there are, you know, it's a work that is encyclopedic in nature, it takes into account, it's, it's, a, it's a, the account of uh, the entire afterlife as envisioned by, uh, Catholic, uh, by the Catholic Church. And um, I'll, I'll just talk a little bit about the structure of uh, Divine Comedy in, in, in this context in case, uh, for those who are not familiar with the work at all, uh, it's a text that's divided large into three uh, books, Inferno, uh, Purgatorio, and Paradiso. Uh, Inferno is an account of Dante's journey through hell, and then through, and, and successively through purgatory, and then in Paradise, he encounters Beatrice again, who has died and uh, assumed this almost quasi-angelic form. Um, and through the first two realms of, uh, you know, for the first two parts of his journey, it is Virgil, the Roman poet Virgil, the author of Enid, who was the official voice of uh, medieval literature in a sense, and whom Dante must have read as, uh, you, uh, you know, at, at school, as you have read Dante in school. We and, read also Virgil. <laughs> and, and Virgil also. Uh, so uh, uh, for the first two realms, it is Virgil who is Dante's guide, and Virgil stands for here, you know, philosophy, um, human reason, and it is natural that while Dante traverses through Inferno and Purgatorio, uh, uh, you know, this classical poet, this a Christian, this, you know, not a pagan poet, uh, should be Dante's guide, but once he enters paradise, or he's about to enter paradise, then Virgil has to be replaced by Beatrice, who has, who has in a sense, assumed a kind of Christ-like significance in Dante's life. She becomes the center point of not only his, you know, um, earthly passion, his amor, but also a symbol of a more universal Christian caritas, you know, a more universal kind of Christian love. And this transcendence from the earthly to the divine is, uh, which is the story of divine comedy. It is the story of Dante's salvation. It is the story of mankind's salvation. Um, uh, and amongst many other things also, a story of Florence's history and, and many other things. Um, this, it, it, you know, it is fitting that Beatrice should, should then assume uh, this uh, kind of role in the end. Though at the very end, it is interesting that Beatrice also kind of relinquishes her position and, and um, it is Saint Bernard of Clairvaux who becomes uh, Dante's guide. When he's just about to sort of uh, come into God's presence and witness the divine light, even Beatrice, Beat he witnesses Beatrice enthroned in that vision amongst all the other angels and saints. Um, and uh, do you want to talk about the theology of it? Yeah, it's, it's interesting. I, I guess, you know, the, one finds echoes, you know, what's happening in our country today, like where paradise is concerned, only Christians are allowed here. You stay out. Yes. You know, so that kind of uh, mixing of religion and politics. Uh, fun fact, you can still get costumes of Virgil, Dante, and Beatrice if you want to go in for Dante cosplay. Uh, there's a wonderful site. I'll, I'll, I'll give you the details later. Yeah, this is absolute, and in the first, in, in fact, the first circle of hell, in, which is the limbo, uh, this consists of entirely virtuous people, you know, great people, Socrates, Aristotle, Virgil himself, Homer, uh, but they have had the rather, you know, rotten luck of being born before Christ's arrival on, in, in this world, therefore they cannot be saved. Their only fault is that they were not baptized. So, you know, and uh, it's not just that Inferno is populated by, uh, the, that part of Inferno is not as terrible as the rest of the sections of Inferno. It is quite, you know, it's uh, sort of. Uh, uh, in fact, it's not terrible at all. Yeah. The, the, the virtue, the sinful pagans suffer in hell, like the sinful Christians. But the virtuous pagans, because they were not baptized, because they were not saved in Christ, cannot enter the Christian heaven. So they are there in what is not really hell, but limbo, a kind of uh, prelude, an antechamber of hell, where they do not suffer in any way. They feel no pain, but they feel a sense of absence because they do not uh, you know, taste the, the blessed presence of God. You see? So it's that, that absence, really. But otherwise, you see, you already see in Dante the beginnings of what we call Christian humanism. You see, which was then going to really start to flower later on in that very century, in the 14th century. You see, uh, uh, the latest 14th century, especially in the work of Petrarch, Francesco Petrarca, who is the, you know, in one sense you may say, takes, takes up where Dante leaves off. In particular, in this figure of a beloved, 
Petrarca too has a beloved, Laura or Laura, who dies. Laura, Laura. In the full career of, of Petrarca's love for her. And it doesn't look as though Petrarca ever got to know Laura well, just as Dante, for different reasons, did not get to know Beatrice well, though Dante and Beatrice, in fact, belong to the same society. They all sort of grew up together within the same circles. But it's just that whenever Dante saw Beatrice in the flesh while she was alive, he was so overcome with a sense of you know, awe and reverence. It's, it's an extraordinary feeling that Dante claims he felt for Beatrice. Even when he first saw her, he was nine and she was eight. And already Dante said, of course, he writes this when he's in his early 20s. So probably, you know, he's thinking back, he's reading back into his childhood what, I, what he actually felt in, after Beatrice's death much later. He said that uh, he felt sort of vision of the God of love and this terrible sense of the God of love or the sense that he was overcome by a force greater than himself, a God to whom he, he will forever bound. So it's extraordinary. It is the love of a man for a woman, it seems a boy for a girl. And yet, already from that point, it takes on a kind of awesome spiritual dimension, and this keeps growing. For that Dante, so that Beatrice becomes Dante's sort of muse, of course, the great inspiration behind his poetry, but also a kind of guardian angel of his life. When Beatrice dies and, of course, goes to heaven, see, there is a, this is extraordinary. There, are, there is a sort of a certain dissatisfaction. There can be no unhappiness in heaven, of course, but there's a certain dissatisfaction. The souls in heaven, they are still concerned about what is happening on earth. See, there are many saints, for instance, including St. Peter, who bitterly uh, condemn what is happening in Italy and in Europe of the day, at the time, what has happened to the church uh, through the successors of St. Peter, the later popes. And similarly, Beatrice there in heaven cannot enjoy perfect heavenly peace because she sees her lover, Dante, on earth, gradually sort of going into um, being led astray morally. So she prays to the Virgin Mary in heaven, who approaches her son, the son to whom she gave birth in the human flesh, but who is, of course, actually an aspect of God, God the Son. Uh, who was born on earth as Jesus Christ. And by, it is by the special dispensation of God as uh, uh, requested by Beatrice that Dante enjoys this unique privilege of going through the next world, through the three realms of the next world, so that he can tell the full moral uh, scheme, uh, the, moral, the moral and divine and theological scheme of God for the universe so that he can himself learn what is good and what is bad, what is sinful and what is blessed, so that he can save himself, and then when he writes about it in his poem, all humankind can be saved. You see, that is the rationale of the Divine Comedy. And it's the acme of human virtue without Christian grace, who leads him through hell and, pur and purgatory, Virgil. But then, as though it has explained to you, Virgil cannot enter heaven because he has not been baptized. He's not a Christian. So there, at the top of the mountain of purgatory, purgatory being a place where souls who have committed sin repented. If you have not repented, you go to hell. But if you have repented but not had time to you know, serve the penance for your sin, then you go to purgatory. You serve out whatever period of time might be allocated to you. And at the end of it, you ascend the mountain of purgatory, the earthly paradise, and so there you proceed to heaven. So there at the top of the Mount Purgatory, of earthly paradise, Dante again sees Beatrice. It is a transformed Beatrice. She's a soul in, in heaven. See? But for a moment, Dante still feels for her something of what he felt you know, for the woman Beatrice on earth, which was, heaven knows, exalted enough, idealized enough. But still, it is not good enough for the feeling that to be entertained towards this angelic Beatrice in heaven. And for a moment when he is overcome by this, with what you will, I mean, we cannot call it love, still less lust, but something which I suppose has some 
element of the sexual in it. It's one of the most famous lines in the Divine Comedy. I felt the marks of the ancient flame. And Vyartaja then chides him bitterly. He's saying, this is not the place to entertain thoughts like this. Do you not know that I have changed? I am not as I was before. And you too must not be as you were before. And Dante is made to go through all the sins of his life, and he weeps bitterly. At the end of that heaving bout of tears, he crosses the river Lethe, the river of forgetfulness, where you know, the sins uh, of his past life are not exactly forgotten. Then he crosses another river, the same river, another shape, where the memory returns, but this time without the pain. And then they proceed to heaven. And can I just, just interrupt to uh, draw upon two things which I was being reminded of as you were speaking. The first is the verse form in which the Divine Comedy is written. I mean, all this while we have been hearing about very serious stuff like, you know, death and purgatory and so on and so forth. But it's written in a very fast kind of rhyme. Now, I don't know any Italian. The, the other three people here do. I read uh, Dante when I was maybe a first or second year undergraduate in a translation by Dorothy L. Sayers, which I read because she wrote the Peter Wimsey novels. So she was this detective writer. And I was told later on that she gets the rhyme very well, even if she doesn't get all the, all the meanings. You know, it's, it's not an exact translation. And I can assure you, if you start reading Dante in a good rhyme translation, it's very difficult to stop. Because each verse sort of leads on to the other one. So I, I wanted to ask Gianluca, as someone who had to do this, how did this affect you? Because this is not a sort of standard pattern of Italian speech or whatever. It's, you know, it, it, it's very artificial in a sense, but it's also like a pop song, you know, keeps dragging you along. And the second thing which I wanted all three of you to comment on, which has remained very vividly with me, you know, 40 years or more later, are the illustrations, because there's a clear geographical scheme leading up to the mountain and the, the nine circles of hell. You know, recently, they've been saying IKEA has just created the 10th circle because of the way in which their furniture has to be put together, but the, the nine circles of hell. So I wanted your comments on both of these, the language as well as the, the imaginative scheme, which has subsequently been represented by so many artists. Yeah, as for the, um, the structure of the comedy, of course, this is not how people express themselves today. And uh, it's a challenge also for modern students to, to approach uh, the language of Dante, because Dante strongly believed uh, in vernacular Italian. He was the first one. So his vocabulary, as opposed to that of Petrarch, for instance, is extremely wide. Sometimes uh, he uses the same words in different parts uh, with two different meanings. The basic uh, is, of course, the dialect from Florence, but he's very much open also to influences from other parts of Italy. And it's important to note that at his time, as was mentioned before, Italy was not a political entity. It was uh, a, a sort of a thought, uh, but didn't exist uh, in the maps uh, or in reality. And of course, these are all groups of three verses with interchange rhyming in endecasyllable, which means the 11 syllables on each line. And you have this scheme of the rhyming, which is A, B, A, B, C, B, C, D. So it sort of leads because you are, your ear gets used and you're waiting for the following rhyme. And uh, what was rhyming in the first group of three verses is waiting for you in the subsequent one. So it's, um, and uh, as far as the second point is concerned, uh, you know, Dante had a very um, great impact from a visual point of view also. And one of the most important representations of the Divine Comedy were probably the illustrations by Sandro Botticelli the famous Renaissance painter, who sketched um, roughly 100 uh, drawings and paintings of the Divine Comedy. And the most famous is called the Map of Hell, La Mappa dell'Inferno, in which uh, he gives uh, visually the idea of uh, this uh, part uh, underneath uh, 
the earth, uh, which starts from Jerusalem and then goes down. You can see the different circles. So visually, it has got uh, a clear impact. And I think uh, we also have to thank Botticelli for being the first one to visualize it in a very artistic manner. Hello. I just want to talk a little bit about uh, the Terza Rima, you know, the interlocking tercets that you were talking about and how that, uh, you know, uh, Dante sort of uses that as an improvisation. I mean, while the language seems very, um, ob obviously, to any reader of modern Italian, removed and archaic, uh, it also has to be said, I mean, given the fact that he's really talking about the afterlife and he's talking about this, uh, you know, the uh, story of salvation, uh, it is all. It, it is a text that is also very vividly realistic. So what Dante does, as many people point out, uh, you know, great critics, our back T.S. Eliot amongst them, is uh, you know he incorporates uh, contemporary vernacular usage, everyday speech, in this uh, you know in this form of the uh, uh, Terzarima, in a way that almost no other poet of the vernacular in Europe, not just in any other Tuscan poet, but in Europe had done so he you know and and he remains lifelong as Gianluca also said committed to this ideal of enriching the vernacular he writes an entire treatise on it it a bit ironically in latin uh de vulgare eloquentia where he's talking about the importance of writing cultivating the elevated style particularly the high tragic style associated with classical literature latin literature in the vernacular you know or to make the vernacular a fit vehicle for that um, and in, you know, in, in, in this project, the Tarzarima also plays uh, a very important part. Uh, uh, the other thing also is that, again, like as uh, you, know, you pointed out, that what he does for the Italian, the Tuscan vocabulary at this point is also quite unprecedented. And um, you know, Eliot says that this, you know, it, it's a great challenge for anybody who sits down to translate Dante because it, if you're da translating from Italian into English, everybody knows that English does not have as many rhyming words. So terza rima becomes a very, very difficult form to replicate in the English language. Uh, and once you lose that terza rima, once you substitute it with something like blank verse, then it becomes, you know, it loses something essential. That text loses something essential is, uh, you know, what Eliot says. And also what very importantly says, and since we are going to lead up to, uh, you know, this conversation surrounding translations of Dante, uh, Eliot also says very famously that uh, in order to be a great master of the language, you have to be its servant. And Dante is the greatest, you know, you know in, in that respect, Dante and Shakespeare, but Dante more than Shakespeare, in that he gives himself totally to the language and allows himself to be led by it. Um, and uh, devotes himself in a way that no other, as, as I said, no other poet of the vernacular had done before. And that changes something uh, very, uh, there's a very vital shift in, in uh, the world of letters in Europe. And it paves the way for humanism then, the advent of humanism, the retrieval of classical texts, the translation of classical texts into various vernaculars from one vernacular to the other and so on and so forth. Uh, so yeah, that's what I want to Yes, so, and uh, you know, Shukanto, the, uh, after your comments, maybe we should start bringing Dante home, as it were, to Bengal. Yes. And, and then, because we'll also have to take a few questions from the audience, so. Uh, but, uh, maybe I could just have a few minutes, I mean, be talking about, you know, one of the greatest poets ever to have been born in the world. You know, I mean, I sometimes think, though, this is maybe an exact view, he leaves Shakespeare looking uh, a, little, a little dim, a little dull, okay. so. What's, uh, so maybe just, just a couple more points, if I be permitted for a few minutes, and then we talk, talk about actually Dante in Bengal, but there's a lot. Uh, one is that about his language, it is, as Gianluca said, and uh, also it is a very down-to-earth language, it's extremely wide because it leaves nothing out, but it is very down-to-earth. His verse is infinitely suggestive, apart from, of course, being symbolic in the theological sense, but it is not sort of nuanced and full of these uh, you know, indefinite suggestions of the Shakespeare's languages. It is very pointed and often very earthly. Okay. The soul who has just been created by God and is issuing from his hand is compared to a little baby, say a helpless little baby who smiles uh, uh, without understanding anything and has to be gradually taught the ways of the world. There are two files of two queue lines of people moving in opposite directions on the bound purgatory and one of the terraces. When they meet each other, they talk before they move on again. How do they talk? 
like two columns of ants who encounter each other and you know weave their antenna together to exchange some kind of communication. I mean, that you could bring in comparisons like this when he's talking about the next world. And another, and this is something crucial to remember, you know, I mean, I think the fact that Dante's uh, poem is so deeply rooted in theology might put us off. We feel that it's moralistic. Okay. We feel that it's, uh, you know, textbook morals. It's not. It's anything but. See, each of the three realms of the next world are divided into, well, it's a complicated scheme of nine, uh, seven plus two plus one, uh, totaling ten. But the hell, for instance, is divided into seven major circles. And although all the circles contain sinners who have committed cardinal sins so that they're damned forever, even then there is a degree of difference, it seems, in the seriousness of their gravity, though they're all damned and therefore of the punishment. Now, whereas the textbook moralist holds that, uh, you know, these uh, young people who go about their immoral ways, or these people who eat too much, who talk too much, who take that, that these are the biggest sort of blots on society. Dante does not think so. It is in the second circle, the first circle of true hell, that you meet those who are sinful lovers. They are sinful. They're in hell. but. They are still, and Paolo and Francesca, who we were talking about, is the most famous pair among them, uh, celebrated in, by Dante. I uh, don't have time to go into the story. But what is their punishment? Simply to hold hands forever and to drift together through the dim, half, uh, the dim dark air. Well, that sounds like a romantic dream, doesn't it? But if you have to keep it up for all eternity, that becomes the punishment of hell. Okay, I mean, there's something that uh, these the younger members of our audience might ponder a little. But when you go further down into the depths of hell, what are the punishments you find? You have all sort of boiling in tar, sunk in, in shit, you know, in defecation. Uh, they are being devoured by serpents and regurgitated, and the limbs of one inter... It's repellent. You can hardly bear to read of those punishments. Dante spares us no detail. And who are the sinners who who suffer those punishments, not the young people who hold hands in the park. They are people who steal, people who take bribes, people who sell governments as a post for money, people who embezzle public funds, people who incite violence and divide society. The people who actually perpetrate violence are in hell, but in the upper circle of hell. They are not such serious sinners as the people behind the scenes who actually you know, instigate that violence. He puts more popes in hell than in purgatory and heaven together. Yes, yes, yes. So, uh, you see, and in the lowest circle of hell, which actually, contrary to what Shomantuk Sethad was saying, is not a place of heat, but of extreme cold. It's a, it's a frozen lake, see? And, the, uh, and the, 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 the damned souls are sunk in the ice there. Who are punished there? Traitors. Because for Dante, the greatest gift that God gave man is reason, which no other uh, earthly creature has. So abuse of that gift is the greatest sin against God. Abuse of uh, you know, your animal appetites, which you share in common with the animals, is bad. You can go to hell. It's not that bad. As abusing the noblest power that you have if you turn it to base use. But I think I'll stop here. There's so much more to say about other aspects. Let's, but, let's uh, turn from these punishments, which, you know, sometimes we wish we could bring back for certain public figures and so on. But uh, to Bengal, Dante, Dante in Bengal, perhaps. A few words on that, Shukantoda. Uh, okay, well, shall I start off? And, yes. Uh, Luther can take yeah. me up on there. Yeah. yeah. Actually, the, uh, Dante has not a great presence in Bengali literature, but Interestingly, he is perhaps the greatest presence in Bengali literature of any Italian writer, much more so, for instance, than Petrarca. And it's strange when you think that, you know, romantic love is a major theme of uh, so much Bengali poetry, as above all, apotheosized by Robindranath. And well, Robindranath in his youth wrote about Petrarca, as he wrote about Dante, as practically his juvenilia. You know, in the Rochadabali, you find it in the Ocholito Shongroho. Uh, but uh, 
seeing that his poems in Semanushi in particular are in a sense very Petrarchan, but uh, by and large, well, how much Tagore was influenced by Dante is open to question. Certainly there's very little uh, clear influence. There are two, there's one curious mention and one and a curious reflection as I think. The mention, amazingly, is in that late novel, the last major novel, the political novel, Charodhai, where Otin says of Ella that she was his Beatrice. But whereas Dante worshipped Beatrice from afar, Otin came too close to Ella, to their mutual destruction. Well, let's do that effect. And finally, there is in a poem in, uh, look, it's either Rogoshodja or John Modile, one of the last volumes of poetry in Rabindranath, um, where there is a picture of a celestial rose, a great rose unfolding in the sky, which is remarkably similar to the image of a celestial rose with which Dante ends the divine comedy. If you look at the, not quite yet, I think the 32nd canto of Paradiso, find there's a rose unfolding in the sky. Oh, thank you. Yeah. So, and that's his, um, you know, there are these interesting kind of possible reflections of Dante in Tagore. There is uh, Dante in Michael Modusudan Dotto. I, I will talk about the, you know, the, the sonnet he actually wrote to Dante and uh, the general fact that Dante must have been an influence on his sonnet writing, Chotu Doshpati Kobitabuli, as with um, was Petrarca, of course. He also has a sonnet to Petrarca. Uh, but, uh, and he sent these sonnets to uh, Victor Emmanuel, the, the king of United Italy, and uh, not the king himself, but his secretary sent back a letter of thanks and congratulations. But interestingly, there are reflections of Dante in Mengdan Botkabo, in that point where Ram goes to the next world, and there are some very clear echoes of divine comedy uh, in, Mingdad, in that episode in the uh, Mingdad dot couple. There's, uh, because, uh, you know, Michael knew the divine comedy very well. He has left uh, his own record. He read, him, read Dante in Italian, which very few Bengalis did. So the fact that when Ram is going to the next world, various people look at him and express wonder that he, a living person, still clad in his body, is going through the next world. This is exactly what the souls of the next world keep saying about Dante. And certain of the, and there's a, an inscription above the entry to the underworld, which is an exactly echoes uh, the inscription over Dante's next world. Abandon all hope, those of you who enter here. Yeah. So, uh, this is but, also what some students used to put outside their own classrooms. <laughs> yeah. I remember that time. That, that, that's what happens if you're fed too much Dante too early, you see. The students have their revenge on the teachers, as always. So, uh, but uh, there, there is another very uh, interesting work in Bengal, you know, 19th century Bengal, Hemchandra. Uh, Would you like to talk about that, Doita? Yeah. Uh, so Hemchandra Banerjee's uh, Chayamui, which is this extremely, it's a strange kind of text. I did not uh, know about it, Shukandada pointed it to me, and then I read uh, it. Uh, it is written, I mean, the text, the prologue itself says very explicitly that it is modeled on uh, Dante's Divine Comedy, and it is a story of uh, the poet's, I mean, whoever the speaker is, uh, his daughter dying, and uh, then, you know, the speaker sort of makes his way through uh, hell, and well, there's no purgatory, obviously, because that does not feature within the Hindu cosmology. Uh, and, um, and then he's led by this mysterious female figure, uh, through these, uh, you know, uh, very uh, strange uh, kind of uh, landscapes of afterlife. And in the end, it is revealed that that, that mysterious figure, that Chayamui, is indeed uh, his daughter. And uh, one of the interesting things is that uh, the way he describes hell, it is, you know, hell is situated, we were talking about the topography of uh, Dante's Divine Comedy, Mount Purgatory, and the valley of, uh, valley that is Inferno. Um, and uh, in this, uh, uh, book, strangely, hell is situated so, sort of in the, star, in the heavens. You know, it's sort of up there. You don't climb downwards, you go up. Um, and the stars are the various kind of uh, 
locations of hell that are uh, pointed out, which is a very you know in interesting but uh, strange. It, it's it's a book that's not much read anymore. I mean, it's it's not remarkable in terms of its poetry. Um, but actually, so, if I just add a, a few sentences, that that, that the, those realms of the, the next world up in the south, there's not only hell; it's also purgatory, <laughs> because even the virtuous souls go there, and once they've been purged of whatever minor sins they may have committed, they can return to heaven, uh, they thought return to earth, and guide the living human beings on earth, which is how this man, the narrator's daughter, has come down to guide and assist her own father. Uh, it's a, imaginatively, it's a remarkable work. If, uh, unfortunately, Hibjohn, those poetic execution is not on a level with the conception of, of his structural, the structural uh, sweep of his imagination. Had that been the case, then that would have been a, you know, like a rival to make down those couple. But the actual quality of the verse, I think, lets him down. Yeah. Okay, uh, I think we'll uh, we'll take questions from the audience if there are any, because we are, uh, you know, about running out of time before we wrap things up. So yes, please, uh, is there someone here to carry mics to audience members? Kiwa se? Ha. This. Here, here. Uh, good evening, sir. Uh, good evening, madam. Thank you for that wonderful presentation. I would like to ask you how you would comment on the structure of the Divine Comedy, where the narrator is accompanied by uh, another poet through different places to be received in the, uh, in the literature outside Bengal, like uh, probably in Javed Nama, where the narrator is accompanied by Rumi. Uh, how would you comment on the structure being received in uh, literatures outside Bengal? Shall we take a few more questions? Uh, there was another question. The question is, what is the question? It was lovely to hear the four of you. Uh, so my question was, uh, as you were saying, that there was a lot of use of uh, theological metaphors or late motifs throughout uh, the linguistic approaches of these masters. And I was thinking maybe it was Blake or it was uh, D.H. Lawrence, who was breaking down this kind of ideologies where they were demythologizing myths and uh, what Dante does, kind of. But why is later on in a post sartrean world where hell is other people and Nietzsche has killed the god, the writers of modern time also go back to using this kind of theological metaphors or late motives in their works? Um, any other questions? Last que I think we have time for one last question. If there is any, I don't think there, there's this one question here. One question here, so it's. Am I audible? Yeah. Just to end things on a very finalistic note, um, would any of the panelists like to talk about the idea of the Empyrean, the ending of Paradiso? I would really like to hear about that. Okay. Um, Open to all three of you if anyone wants no, to. No, I think you should read it. Uh, why should I tell you how? Read it. It's, more, it's a more enriching experience, I think. Yeah, I think the whole point about the Empyrean is that you cannot talk about it. You see, it is the fully realized uh, it's sort of the glory of God. Without any shadow, any limitation, you can just, Dante stands before it and wonders. See, and there's that last image, the book that it says that all the scattered leaves of the universe have been bound together into a single volume. But it, it is by definition beyond human expression. Yeah. He says that you know, words have failed him and intellect has taken over, memory has no place anymore, etc. I mean, I can answer your, to answer your question about why authors go back to Dante in a, in a kind of, I don't know, post uh, theistic world. Is, I think it's because of his very vivid realism. I mean, again, like I go back to Eliot because he uses Dante in Wasteland so vividly and then in Little Gidding also, where he's using Dante, sort of a Dante's imagery scene to talk about, you know, the kind of hallucinations that happen after uh, an air raid uh, uh, during the war. So the, that, you know, it, it remains the vivid realness of Dante's verse, you know, despite the fact that it is about theology and God and about all of these abstract things. Um, it, it, uh, that is what lends itself to appropriation, I think, in a, even a world that does not hold on to that belief or that uh, theology anymore. And I think one can add that, you see, Dante himself doesn't remain confined within his theology. There are, in particular, find there are figures in hell. 
who are uh, condemned for some sin, but they have a human dimension going beyond that. For instance, his old teacher, Brunetto Latini, a greatly revered teacher, who he puts in hell. I mean, maybe uh, you know, we teachers should be thankful that few of our students are likely to write a work comparable to Divine Comedy, otherwise we'd all end up in hell ourselves. But still, the way in which this tormented, naked figure of Brunetto Latini being mm. pelted with rain or running on hot sands, and yet as he runs, says Dante, as he runs, he can't, can't stop for a minute. He talks to Dante for a minute and then has to run on. That's his punishment. But Dante says, as he runs, he was like a runner in the race, but not the losing, but the winning runner. <laughs> and for a second, that damn tormented figure is in a kind of glory. Or Ulysses, Ulysses in Italian. Oh, he's, uh, I mean, you know, that, the, the, this particular part of the legend of Ulysses is not there in Homer or is there in classical source. This is invented by Dante. That after Ulysses has returned to Ithaca in his old age, he cannot stand there, he cannot stick there. So he feels, uh, you know, the, the, the sort of tormented, said that he must go out again. He has this divine discontent to go out again, to explore again, and he sets out with some old companions in a ship which finally gets shipwrecked. This is the, uh, the, the, the myth that some five or six hundred years later, uh, so over five hundred years later, Tennyson takes up in his poem, Ulysses. That's from Dante, that's not from Homer. And you know, this kind of indefinite uh, exploration of a new universe. So Dante's theology is not a confining theology in any sense. It's an, well, I can't say liberating theology because the word has come to mean something else today. Uh, but it's an thing. expansive theology, yes. It opens out into the world. Okay, Shukantada, I mean, something that Jean Lucas said which, which struck me is that you have to read him. What about reading Dante in a language which is familiar to us? I mean, Bangla, I mean, uh, you know, you said you talk a little bit about translations and what's going on, because I think it is, it is necessary to read him. You know, I, I, I know no Italian, but my love for Dante grew through excellent English translations. What about those who uh, are most familiar with Bangla? This is what happens when you have two experts. They, <laughs> they can't decide which of them is going to speak. So, yeah. Suggesting I should sort of start this argument. Actually, there are three uh, translations, uh, Bengali translations of the Divine Comedy. Um, there's, in fact, quite a lot of literature on Dante in the 20th century. Uh, many of the uh, 20th century modernist poets and critics they wrote about Dante. Um, in 1965, the 700th year of Dante's birth, there was a special volume of Ekon, edited by Shobhita Chattopadhyay, with a Dante bibliography done by Shankar Ghosh, which is full of many illuminating articles on Dante generally, and also on the reception of Dante in Bengal. Uh, there's writing in particular by, a lot of writing by a mind and modernist, Chanchal Kumar Chattopadhyay, uh, also translations by Dante, of Dante by Chanchal Kumar, and, but maybe the most interesting effect, the most productive effect that Chanchal Kumar's writings had was that another person, Shamal Kumar Gongopadhyay, read it. Now, this Shamal Gongopadhyay is not to be confused with the novelist of that name. This is a different person of the same name. He read Chanchal Kumar's writings and his translations and felt that they didn't go far enough. And he felt he wanted to translate the whole of the Divine Comedy and just produced this very fine translation in three volumes, in Tersa Rima, actually. It's a remarkable work. It's there, it's fully there. And in fact, uh, Shamal Babu is still with us very happily. Maybe not well enough to come here to the others. It would have been a privilege for him to be present here. The, the final translation, So there's, uh, 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 so uh, the final one is, uh, uh, is is the one that's coming out right now. It's being brought out by Jadapur University Press. The first volume of that is, uh, or Norok Inferno, is already out. And uh, Shukandada is in charge of sort of editing that series. Uh, this is being done. This has been done so far um, by uh, Alpona Ghosh, 
who uh, who sort of sent it in a it was quite random who she got in touch with the Jadavpur University Press and she sent her work she had been translating this on her own uh, during her time that she spent in rural bengal for a while and she just taught herself italian and started you know you know just started translating divine comedy as one does and uh, uh, she sent uh, the first sort of installment just in a parcel like a whole i mean the obhijit gupta who is the director of the jadhav university press sent it to me and shukant to that there's this lady who out of the blue has sent me an entire bengali translation of the divine comedy and we looked at it and it was a remarkably fine translation see unfortunately alpara the passed away last year she, she was uh, the advanced in years and then uh, it's a, she did see the first installment norok in ferno the second installment shuddhi lok purgatorio is finally about to go to press but unfortunately too late for alpanadi to see it and the third volume which may be called shortko or shortko lok that is still to come in fact she couldn't put the finishing touches to that uh, but so th there's a you know, lot of preparatory work to be done before the any of these volumes can appear and uh, i'm doing that really uh but um, we have a, a series brought out by Jadavpur University Press of translations from Italian into Bengali the only condition being that the translations have to be done directly from the Italian text and not from an English translation see so uh, that's a good condition yeah well yeah which uh, limits the number of possible translations but that's the only thing that makes it worthwhile though it has translated uh Machiavelli's Il Principe the prince for that I my trans myself translated some extracts from Leonardo da Vinci and but the big uh, mainstay so far is Alpona Ghosh's translation of uh, uh, this Dibbo Milon we call it the divine comedy I think that might be a, a suitable place to start winding things up if there are any final words from Gianluca or Shukantada or Doita uh, well, uh, you know, I cannot uh, read or speak uh, Bengali, but uh, I made it a point to buy one of these uh, translations of the Divine Comedy. It's a thick book. Uh, it's very nice to look uh, for the <laughs> for the <laughs> characters of the Bengali language. But of course, I will bring it back home as a keen memory of my years here in Bengal and in Kolkata. Right. Thank you all, and uh, I think we can conclude by saying that this man who died over 700, and 700 years ago is still alive, and not just in his native Italy, but in many strange and sublime places across the world. So thank you very much indeed.